We're starting out chapter five today. We're gonna to talk about probability distributions. In 5.1, we're gonna go through probability distributions specifically. In 5.2, we'll touch on binomial probability distributions. The key concept in 5.1, we're gonna cover some definitions, including the concept of a random variable, the concept of a probability distribution. We're also going to illustrate a probability histogram, and it's a graph that visually depicts a probability distribution. From that probability distribution, we're gonna learn how to calculate the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation. Then, of course, we're always interested in are our values significant? So we're gonna go through how to determine whether outcomes are significant, whether they're significantly low or significantly high. Let's go through some definitions. So first is a random variable. A random variable is a variable, typically represented by X, that has a single numerical value determined by chance for each outcome of a procedure. We'll go through lots of examples today, including looking at random variables. The next definition is a probability distribution. A probability distribution is a description that gives the probability for each value of the random variable. I emphasize probability because it doesn't give the frequency, it gives the probability. Again, we'll look at examples of both of these. For a probability distribution, it's often expressed in the format of a table, a formula, or a graph. We'll go through each one of these. For some additional definitions, we're gonna go through discrete versus a continuous random variable. For a discrete random variable, it's a collection of values that is finite or countable. If there are infinitely many values, the number of values is still countable if it's possible to count them each individually. So for example, the number of tosses of a coin before getting heads, we can still count those. So one, two, three, four, five, even if it takes an infinite number of times to get heads. Next, for continuous random variable, it has infinitely many values and the collection of values is not countable. In other words, it's impossible to count the individual items because at least some of them are on a continuous scale. So such as body temperatures, for example, those can range from 98.6 to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, through 98.6, 0, 0, 0, 0, 9, et cetera. So it's a range of values. Another way to think about discrete versus continuous random variables is something that we've seen before. So an example like this, where for discrete random variables, we have individual data points we can count. Whereas for a continuous random variable, we see just a line representing the data. So it's a continuous line of all these data points. So we can't count each one individually. And here's that example here for body temperature. So we can monitor not necessarily body temperature, but temperature over time, and we get this continuous line. Next, we're gonna go through the probability distribution requirements. These are important in verifying, do we have a probability distribution? So every probability distribution must satisfy each of these three requirements. The first being there is a numerical, not categorical, random variable X. And with this variable X, its number values are associated with a corresponding probability. Again, we'll go through an example. The second requirement is that the summation, remember that notation here, the summation of all the probabilities of X, that random variable, is equal to one. We're used to dealing with probabilities in this way that they have to add up to one. We've seen that before with complements. Here for a probability distribution where X is our variable, the probability of all X values that are possible also has to add up to one, just as the two complements had to add up to one. So the sum of all the probabilities must be equal to one but if the sum is 0 0.999 or 1.001, .001, that's also okay because this is likely a result from a rounding error or an estimate. The third requirement we've also seen before, so the probability of our variable X has to be between zero and one. The probability again can equal zero. It can also equal one, but it has to be between zero and one. 
So in other words, the probability value must be between zero and one inclusively, where it can equal zero, it can also equal one, it can also be any number in between zero and one. Okay, so those are our three requirements for a probability distribution. Let's look at an example. Here, let's consider tossing two coins with the following random variable. So an example of a variable x, here x is the number of heads when two coins are tossed. That's our variable. More specifically, this x is a random variable, which is important here for these probability distributions because its numerical values depend on chance, right? So we toss a coin, by chance we're either gonna get heads or tails. So this is a random variable because it has numerical values and not categorical values, and its values depend on chance. And notice that the variable is a numerical value because we're looking at the number of heads when two coins are tossed. So the variable itself is the number of heads when two coins are tossed. It's not the act of tossing a coin. It's not getting either heads or tails. The variable itself is number of heads. Let's talk through what's the sample space. So again, I like to draw these lines. Here, this represents the first coin toss. Here, this would represent the second coin toss. So then our sample space, we toss two coins, then we could get heads, heads, tails, tails, heads, then tails, or tails, then heads. Right, that's all the different possibilities when two coins are tossed. Here, figuring out the sample space was relatively easy because we only have two coins that are being tossed. If this got more complicated, we'd wanna rely on our counting rules that we learned in the last section of chapter four. So in total for our sample space, we have four different possibilities. Then for example, the probability for getting zero heads when tossing two coins is gonna be this option here of getting tails and tails. So the probability for getting zero heads would be this one option out of the four options. So then this probability is one fourth or 0.25. Then if we do that for the other options, so getting two heads or getting one heads, then we have this table here. So for zero heads, we just calculated that. That's a probability of 0 0.25. For getting one heads, then we have this option here and this option here. So two out of the four possibilities. So then this probability is 0 0.5 or one half. The other option we could have is that we get two heads when two coins are tossed. That probability is similar to what we do for the zero heads possibility. So we have both heads. So one option here, again, divided by four, our probability is 0 0.25. Notice how we set this table up. So our variable X is the number of heads when two coins are tossed. That variable can be equal to zero, one, or two. And then we figured out the probabilities by figuring out the sample space first, and then figuring out the probability for each of the corresponding variables. Let's continue on with this example. So with two coins tossed, the number of heads can be zero, one, or two. We just figured that out. Now this table that we just made on the last slide, this is a probability distribution table because it gives the probability for each value of the random variable x, where our variable could be zero, one, or two, and then each has a corresponding probability. Let's also check, does it satisfy those three requirements that we just listed? Well, the first requirement is satisfied because the variable x is a numerical and not a categorical random variable. Again, importantly with our variable X, it has to be a number. This variable could not be, for example, that we got one heads and one tails. The variable itself has to be a number. So that's why we have zero, one, or two as our variable. It's also considered a random variable because we obtained the outcome by chance. So we tossed a coin and we either got heads or tails. So that scenario is by chance. And therefore, the variable that comes from that scenario is also by chance, so it's a random variable. 
Another part of this requirement, its values are all associated with probabilities. So yes, we proved that here, that all these variables have an associated probability that we calculated. The second requirement, do all the probabilities of our variable x total up to one? Well, yes they do because we have 0 0.25 plus 0.5 plus 0 0.25. So yes, all these probabilities add up to one. For our third requirement, does each value of probability of the variable x, is it between zero and one? Well, yes, so 0 0.25 is between zero and one, 0 0.5 is between zero and one, and 0 0.25 again is between zero and one. So we can conclude altogether that this table here is a probability distribution. It satisfies each of these three requirements. Let's also talk through one more thing. So is this variable discrete or is it continuous? Well, it's discrete because it has three different possible values, zero, one, or two. We can definitely count those. In other words, three is a finite number, so it satisfies the requirement of being a finite number, which is what we're looking for when deciding between a discrete random variable or a continuous random variable. Discrete random variables are finite, they're countable. Next, we're gonna turn this table into a histogram, which you've seen histograms before. So here, a probability histogram, which is what we're gonna make, it's similar to a relative frequency histogram that you have seen before, but the vertical scale shows probabilities instead of relative frequencies based on actual sample results. So vertical scale, we're gonna have probabilities instead of relative frequencies. For example, we're gonna make probability histograms like this, where we have probability on the y-axis. On the right here, this is a relative frequency histogram that you have seen before, where we have relative frequencies on the y-axis, as we see here, where these relative frequencies were based on actual sample results. But in chapter five, we're gonna look at these probability histograms, where on the y-axis, we have our probability values. So for this chapter, we're gonna look at these. So in order to make this histogram, all we did was we took this data here. So number of heads from two coins, we have zero, one, and two. Then we graph the probabilities here. So 0 0.25 for zero. Also 0 0.25 here when two heads are obtained when we toss the coin twice. Then here in the middle, when we have one number of heads, that probability was 0 0.5. So you can see between this table and this histogram, we have the same data. It's just presented either in a table here or in this histogram. Okay, so we talked about for probability distributions, they can be either in a table or in a histogram or with a formula. So let's look at the formula. So the formula is the probability of X where X is our variable is gonna equal one over two multiplied by two minus X factorial multiplied by x factorial. In our case, x is our variable, so x can equal 0, 1, or 2. This will not always be the case. So here our variable is 0, 1, or 2, but of course that won't always be the case with whatever problem we're working on. I want to go through an example of how to use this probability formula, especially to take into account do we do factorial first or do we multiply first down here in the denominator. So let's do this example when x, our variable, is equal to zero. We could also repeat this for x equal to one and x equal to two, because here, those are our three variables, zero, one, and two. When x is equal to zero, we plug in and we say one divided by two multiplied by two minus zero, because this is our x, close parentheses, factorial, and then zero, our x value factorial. Let's start simplifying this here. So we're gonna still have one divided by, then two multiplied by two factorial. Notice that I took whatever was here in parentheses, and that's what I'm computing the factorial for. 
I'm not multiplying this two that's outside of the parentheses into that factorial. So we have one over two times two factorial multiplied by zero factorial, where we know zero factorial is one. Let's continue simplifying here. So one over still two here. I'm only doing the factorial for what was in the parentheses, not this two on the outside of the parentheses. So two factorial is two times two. I didn't include this one anymore because when we multiply something by one, we multiply it by itself. So one over two times two factorial, then we get one over four. That is the same probability we got from earlier of 0 0.25. I recommend you practice doing this formula with also x equal to one and x equal to two. Don't forget the order of operations here. So notice we did the factorials before we did the multiplication here in the denominator. So when you do this calculation again with the x equal to one and x equal to two, we'll get these values here. So again, 0 0.25, 0.5 and 0 0.25. When working with these probability distributions, again, we can represent this as a table, as a histogram, and also using this formula where we know all of our values for x are variable. So it should make sense that the probabilities found using this formula are the same ones we get from this table, which would be the same ones we can see on a probability histogram. Let's go through another example here. So hiring managers were asked to identify the biggest mistakes that job applicants make during an interview, and the table below is based on their responses. Let's then answer, does this table below describe a probability distribution? Let's keep in mind those three requirements that a probability distribution has to fill. Well, let's look at our table again. For the first requirement, this table definitely violates the first requirement because X itself is not a number. More specifically, X is not a numerical random variable. When we see values of X like this, we either have numerical or categorical variables, and here these are definitely categorical. There's also another reason this doesn't fit the requirements for a probability distribution because the sum of all these probabilities adds up to 1.57. For requirement number two, that sum should be one. For the third requirement, which I don't show explicitly here, all of these would fit that third requirement that this is between zero and one, this is between zero and one, as is this, and as is this. But based on these two, we say that because all three requirements are not satisfied, we conclude the table does not show a probability distribution. The next part of 5.1 is being able to calculate the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation of a probability distribution. One thing to keep in mind here with a probability distribution is we have a description of a whole population rather than just a sample of the population. So some terminology to keep in mind because the mean, standard deviation, and variance are all related to the population. They're considered parameters and not statistics. Parameters describe the population while statistics describe a sample. So here I'm gonna show you the formulas for the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation of a discrete probability distribution. Remember for discrete, we can actually count those numbers. So here for the mean or mu, the probability distribution can be calculated as this. Keep in mind, this means summation. This is our variable. This is multiplied by the probability of each variable. There's two different presentations of variance here. So sigma squared. So sigma squared can be equal to this, where we include mu here, the mean, in this calculation. So it should be clear that we need our value of mu, our mean, before we can calculate the variance. You may also see it written like this. So again, the summation, but now we're subtracting mu squared. Again, we have to know the value of the mean before we can calculate the variance. The last formula here we're gonna look at is standard deviation. 
Remember, standard deviation squared or sigma squared is the variance. So then for standard deviation, it's also then equal to the square root of the variance. Let's talk through some definitions here and then we'll do some calculations. So for the expected value, the expected value of a discrete random variable of x is denoted by uppercase E. The expected value or uppercase E is the mean value of the outcomes. So in other words, uppercase E, our expected value, is equal to mu, the mean. That means we can calculate our expected value E the same way we calculate the mean or mu. So it's equal to this. The summation of our variables X multiplied by the probability of that variable. Importantly, we need to sum all of these values for each of the variables in our data. So in other words here, the expected value of a random variable X is equal to mu. Again, as I just mentioned, we can calculate the expected value by computing this, which is what we do for finding the mean or mu. Now let's do some examples of calculating the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation for this same set of data we've been working with. Remember our notation here, mean is mu, variance is sigma squared, and standard deviation is sigma. Let me remind you on the formulas here, so this is our mean, this is our variance, and this is our standard deviation. Now, because we can calculate the standard deviation by taking the square root of our variance value, then it would be most beneficial for the mean and the variance to be calculated first. To calculate the mean and the variance, we should calculate definitely x multiplied by the probability of x. Looking at this variance equation, it would also be helpful then to calculate this portion of the equation. So x minus mu squared. So we'll calculate x minus mu squared, then multiplied by the probability of x. For both the mean and the variance, we need to remember to sum all of the values in our data set. Then once we obtain variance, we can get the standard deviation by taking the square root of that value. So to do this, first we'll calculate this. So when covering up this column here, we've seen this before. This is the table we're used to looking at. So our variable and then the probability of that variable. We need this information before we can start calculating the mean. Remember for the mean, we're gonna take our X value multiplied by the probability of that X value. So for example, when X is equal to zero, we have zero multiplied by 0 0.25. Again, we do the same thing for x equal to 1 and x equal to 2, and we get 0, 0.5, and 0.5. Then, really importantly for our mean, we need to sum all of these values so we get a value of 1. We definitely won't always get a value of 1. It just works out here for the set of data that we're working with. So again, to remind you on the equation for the mean, now we have a value calculated, so mu is equal to 1.0. Now that we know the mean is equal to 1, now we can calculate the variance because we needed this value in order to calculate the variance. So now I'm adding on this last column here. We've already done this here in the third column. To calculate the variance, we need to do this for each of our variables. So let's talk through this. When x is equal to zero, which it does in the first row, we're gonna take zero minus mu squared multiplied by 0 0.25, that's our probability of the variable x. That's then equal to 0 0.25. Because we calculated the mean or mu is equal to one, we can plug in one for all of our different variables here. So then when x is equal to 1, we'll do the same thing, but we'll plug in our x value of 1 and the probability of getting that x value, which is 0 0.50. We do the same thing for our next variable. Then we can't forget that for variance, we need to sum up all those values we just got. When we sum up all these values, we get a variance value of 0 0.50. 
Again, to remind you about the equation for variance or sigma squared, then we get our final answer of 0 0.5. So, so far we have a mean of 1.0. Now we have a variance of sigma squared of 0.5. Now we can calculate the standard deviation by taking the square root of that value of our variance. So I'm showing you the equation here. Sigma is equal to the square root of the variance. In other words, sigma is equal to the square root of sigma squared. Then for that, sigma squared is 0.5. We take the square root of 0.5 and we get 0.7. So now we have our mean, our variance, and our standard deviation. Here, it actually seems to be a little bit more straightforward to get the variance and then get our standard deviation. That's not always true. Sometimes we wanna get our standard deviation, then square that to get the variance. So you can certainly do it both ways. You can calculate the variance and then take the square root. You could also use the equation for sigma or standard deviation then end up squaring that to get your variance. Maybe try it either way and see which one you're more comfortable with. The next step we're gonna do is a really important step. So we're gonna to start to interpret these values. Now, based on what we just calculated, we can say that when tossing two coins, the mean number of heads is equal to 1.0. Notice that the unit for our mean is the same unit for our variable, so 1.0 heads. The variance we just calculated is 0 0.50. Notice importantly the unit here, so this is heads squared. Then our standard deviation is 0.7. Again, notice our unit here. Let's connect this back now to our expected value. So the expected value for the number of heads when two coins are tossed is also the same as our mean. It's 1.0 heads. Another important point here for the interpretation, if we were to collect data on a large number of trials with two coins tossed in each trial, then we'll expect to get a mean value of 1.0 heads. Remember our rule of large numbers, if we do this many, 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 many times, then we'll get even closer to this mean value of 1.0. So with 5.1, it's a little bit longer of a section, so I'm gonna stop here for 5.1, part one. Next time we'll go through 5.1, part two. You'll use the same student outline for 5.1, part one, and 5.1, part two. Remember for exam two coming up, we're covering all we did for chapter four and then 5.1 and 5.2. Okay, so in the next lecture recording, you'll see the rest of 5.1. I'll see you then.